Hey folks, today's episode is sponsored by Squarespace. Whether you need a portfolio to showcase your work, a store to sell your products and services, or a blog to share your ideas, Squarespace gives you everything you need to make your next move into a reality. Once you've used Squarespace's beautifully designed templates and customizable features, you're going to wonder why you never made a website by yourself before. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com and enter offer code WTF to get 10% off your first purchase. Plus a free domain with the purchase of an annual plan. We're also sponsored by Fusion TV's The AV Club. You may know AV Club editor John Tatey from the online celebrity game show Pick a Choice or from the Internet's most cordial critics versus critics argument, Polite Fight. In all likelihood, you don't know him at all. And he's okay with that as long as you watch his new show. The AV Club, hosted by John Tatey, is a deep dive into pop culture every Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern on Fusion TV. TV. Go to fusion.net slash where to watch for details. Whoo, all right, let's do the show. Lock the gates. <laughs> all right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fuckadelics? What's happening? I'm Mark Marin. This is my podcast. How's it going? What's going on back east? Man, I got out just under the wire. Was it as bad as they say? Are you guys all right? Did you dig out? Is everybody out from under the snow? Today I have uh, Louis Thoreau on, the uh, documentarian, and a very funny guy. I I enjoy talking to him, and I'll explain some more about that interview in a second. Uh, What what, what did I want to tell you? Uh, Oh, yeah, you can come see me. Next weekend, I'll be in Oakland on Friday. I'm going to be in uh, Seattle on Saturday at the Moor. Um, I'm I'm, a, I'm in Oakland on uh, Friday at the Fox, and on Sunday I'll be in Vancouver at the Vogue. You can go to wtfpod.com slash tour for uh, all the upcoming dates. Maybe I should give them to you. They're all selling pretty good. I mean, Burlington was pretty amazing. Did I was I able to talk to you about that? That was a that was a great show. It was freezing in Burlington, but people still came out. I don't know. I think I, I think we did about 1100 and a 1200 seater or something like that. The woman who I picked to open for me, who I, I just saw her stuff online. Annie Russell was great and it was a nice long show. I did some new stuff and uh, it was great to be up in Burlington. I haven't been there in a long time. Had one of the best meals of my life there and it was, uh, I, I had no idea what was going to happen. We had very little time. We had about an hour. We went to this uh, place called the Hen of the Wood and had just an, uh, an amazing meal. It was like a beautiful, like a trout split open the whole fish and there were some watercress on top and some fried on- like onion uh, rings. Of- it was like, it was just uh, creative and fucking amazing. This is one of the best meals of the trip. And then the next morning we went to Penny Cluse's Cafe, had one of the best breakfasts, grilled corn muffins. Look, you know, this may not be relevant to whatever life you're living or whatever condition the world is in, but I'm choosing today to be, you know, relatively chipper. Uh, but grilled corn muffins that, and I talked about this with Kim Gordon, not dropping names. It just came up, I believe. East Coast thing. Grilled corn muffins are one of the, uh, an uncelebrated, uh, life pleasure. If you, you know, if you are, are geared that way. The grilled corn muffin. I was going to tell you about the other tour dates because they are happening. Uh, like I said, Oakland, Seattle, the Moore Theater, March 25th. Uh, still a few tickets left for that. I don't know. The Vogue, uh, March 26th. Uh, the Fox in Oakland, March 24th. But I'll be coming to Austin March 31st to the Paramount Theater. I'll be in Boulder on April 7th at the Boulder Theater. I'll be in Denver at the Paramount Theater in Colorado on April 8th. I'll be doing three shows at the Aladdin Theater in Portland, Oregon, um, April 21st, Friday, and April 22nd, Saturday. Uh, a show was added on Saturday. Paps Theater in Milwaukee, April 27th, the Orpheum in Madison on April 28th, and then two shows at the Pantages in Minneapolis, where I'll be shooting a Netflix special on April 29th. And then the uh, on the other side of that, I'll be in Philly at the Merriam Theater on May 12th, and D.C., at the Warner on May 13th. Uh, 
given the way things are going, that might be a, a relatively abandoned city, just a bunch of e- empty federal government buildings that uh, once housed the uh, the machinery of a uh, of a uh, of a government. Who knows? We're sponsored today by our friends at Casper, and I call them friends because friends take care of you. What better way to take care of somebody than to help them get a good night's sleep? The Casper is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. It has supportive memory foams that create an award-winning sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce. We got everyone involved in WTF on the Casper bandwagon. First I got one, then my producer got one, then he got one for his kid, and that's what happens with Casper. It's like a virus video if a viral video could also be the most comfortable bed you've ever slept on try casper for 100 nights risk-free in your own home if you don't love it they'll pick it up and refund you everything casper understands the importance of truly sleeping on a mattress before you commit especially considering you're going to spend a third of your life on it get 50 dollars toward any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash wtf and using offer code wtf as always there's free shipping and returns to the u.s and canada terms and conditions apply that's casper.com slash wtf offer code wtf i'm sort of obsessed with this lee morgan guy this uh this this trumpet player and um i can't shake it like I'm like I'm, I'm amassing his records and then the people that uh, produce the documentary there's a documentary uh it's called I called him Morgan I came at this guy with no nothing no nothing I just uh, I bought a record on a recommendation from Dan down at Gimme Gimme I put the record on expecting some bebop music from a secondary player and it just like it just drilled itself right into my guts and my mind and my heart and my soul and I was like who the fuck is this why is this happening uh it it didn't seem uh, elaborate or 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 a show offy it was just deep man and uh, yeah and, and so I started getting all these Lee Morgan records and I guess because I was talking about it the people that made the movie the documentary mostly about his wife who shot him at a club on a snowy night in New York, shot him dead. Um, it became a very fascinating story to me. Substance, substance abuse, murder, uh, being uh, genuinely gifted. Uh, it just, it, it, I, I recommend it, you know, and I, I just because I like knowing the backstory and it's always amazing to me, like, why did this guy resonate with me? And, you know, he was... Uh, a deeply uh, addicted and, uh, you know, it, it, sometimes that affords you a type of creative freedom. I'm not suggesting it and, or I'm not saying that it's a starting place, but there is something about that zone. And then I ran into my, uh, my opto- optometrist, Dr. Kane, who is a trumpet player, jazz trumpet player from Indianapolis and, uh, you know, a, a good trumpet player in his own right, but definitely a bebop kind of character. I just ran into him on the street and I told him I was getting into Lee Morgan. He's like, oh, yeah, 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 Lee Morgan. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. He said that Miles was like, this is this kid's got it. And uh, he told me the album that he liked. And uh, boy, I, I can't I cannot stop listening to Lee Morgan. It's like it's almost compulsive at this point. I got I think I got to have Dr. Kane on the show, you know. We're sponsored by uh, some more friends today, our friends over at Squarespace. And why are they our friends? Because they helped us make WTFPod.com, and we want them to be your friends, too. Whatever your next big idea might be, count on Squarespace to help you create an eye-catching online platform that brings it to life. Squarespace gives you everything you need to look like an expert right from the start, whether you're making a gallery or an online store or a simple blog. You even get a unique domain so you can stand out in the online wilderness. Plus, with Squarespace, Spaces award-winning templates. Creating a beautiful website is a simple and intuitive process. You can add and arrange your content and features just by dragging and clicking. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. And if you do have a question, Squarespace's award-winning 24-7 customer support can help you with any problem, no matter what it is. So make your next move and start your free trial at squarespace.com today. Enter offer code WTF to get 10% off your first purchase. And if you purchase an annual plan, you'll get a free domain. That's squarespace.com. Offer code WTF. So, Louis Thoreau, the documentarian. 
I'll be honest with you, as I was honest with him. I've met Louis Thoreau before. He 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 approached me because he wanted to interview me for something he was working on that didn't sort of like come together. And I spent like hours with him, I think. Hours. So that was really my only knowledge of Louis Thoreau. And I liked him. I thought he was funny. I enjoyed talking to him. But whatever he was shooting went nowhere. It just went away. And then I think uh, he emailed me not long before he was promoting this movie he's got out now, my Scientology movie, which I watched, uh, you know, telling me he was sorry that he didn't use that stuff. But I remembered him. And then I watched the Scientology movie and I enjoyed it a great deal. It's a good movie. But he's been making documentaries for years and I don't have a, a deep, uh, uh, you know, experience with his canon, with his uh, oeuvre, with his, I don't know if that's the right word to use, but with his work. How's that? Like, I watched the Scientology movie, and I talked to him for another movie that he didn't make, and that was about it. But I enjoyed the Scientology movie, and I like him as a person. So this is an interview coming from that, and I copped to that, and we worked with it. And uh, I just, I find him hilarious. And I don't know if he's even trying to be hilarious, but this is um my conversation with uh, Louis Thoreau, and uh, we're talking about, among other things, his uh, new documentary, My Scientology Movie. It's now in theaters and on VOD, iTunes, and Amazon Video. And uh, he approaches it in a unique way. I've seen a couple of Scientology documentaries. But uh, this is me and uh, Mr. Thoreau in the garage talking. <laughs> Thoreau. 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 Why? Why is it not Thoreau? Because it's O-U-X and it's a French name, so it's like on analogy with Roux sauce. Uh, but wait, I, but, but you have a cousin who's an actor. Justin. Justin Thoreau. So what's it? Exactly. Yeah. What, what's that about? He's getting it wrong, dude. Did you tell him? Yes. And? He didn't listen. Huh. Is he is he obstinate? Uh, I guess he's got his own way of doing things. I think that the rot started with his dad. There was a bifurcation in the family tree. My dad stayed true to Thoreau. Uh huh. And Uncle Gene went Thoreau. Huh. And no reason was it? Uh... I think on analogy with uh, Henry David Thoreau. So maybe they thought it sounded. Maybe the people just that was that came more naturally. Well, what did your uncle do? Was he uh, was he, he was a, a writer? Law, he's a lawyer, but not a writer. Not no. like Henry David no. Thoreau, which is no. spelled differently. Different spelling. Your father, the author, yeah, went with Thoreau, and he yeah, and he's okay with it. He he likes it. But then you go back another generation, and they were saying Teru, Teru, Teru. Oui, oui. So, where did you grow up? London, England, the whole time. Pretty much. With summers we spent on Cape Cod, because uh, my dad was American, still is, and um, he brought us over, back to the homeland to kind of Americanize us a little bit. He felt we were becoming too stuffy and British. But kept it Thoreau, nonetheless. Mm. You would think once he hit the shores, Thoreau would be the way to go. You think Thoreau's more American? Somewhat. There's the way I would have pronounced it. So by reading it, not knowing French... We're not really, or just willing to err on the side of American. I would go with Thoreau. I'm just grateful if people don't say thorax. Yeah, well, that would be a whole other can of worms. So your dad was like a big, important author and still is? Yes, he's a successful and well-regarded literary author. He's a travel writer, short story writer, and novelist. And what? And your mom also in the arts? BBC. Uh, she was a BBC producer. On the radio. Uh-huh. So you grew up in a home full of books sure. and... Uh, Long words. Uh, uh, you know, lofty topics. Kind of. Yeah. Discussions around the table, books, uh, notable political activities. Maybe. Uh, perhaps uh, art. Not so much Not so much art. I mean, no, not really art. Not even music that much. There was, uh, mainly it was about books. Uh, re you know, writing being the, the kind of acme of what it means to be a, um, you know, achieve, to, to achieve something in life was to be a, a literary writer. But they were, you know, we watched TV as well. We had a, it wasn't uh, all high-minded. Right. 
But did you did you think about being a writer? Yeah, yeah. I'd and, like to think maybe I am a little bit of a writer. I've just written a movie. The Scientology movie? Yeah. I know. It's sort of, you know, you think it's a documentary, and then you realize this guy's got a heavy hand in this. There's, I mean, <laughs> I like to think, I mean, I get a writing. That's the credit I get on all my documentaries, you know, Scientology and otherwise. It's written and presented by Louis Theroux. Well, I mean, this is the thing, like, you know, like, you came and talked to me about something. You ate up a lot of my day. Yes, I did. Well, uh, because of some high-minded idea you had that was half-baked that went nowhere, and you gave me a book about Nazis as if to <laughs> make up for the the time you ate out of my life. Did you read the book? No, I can't now. It's We're living in it. Not as bad. It's not that bad. The book, I think the book was about the extermination camps, wasn't it? Right. Does that, are you diminishing it somehow? Is this a, <laughs> you took a tone like, no, it was a lighter sort of. No, I just say like, I don't think they've set up a, 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 a you know, not, not even concentration camps, actual extermination camps, Treblinka, yeah. where no one came out alive. Right. No, yeah, you gave me that book and said I should read it. And I wanted to. I have it. I'm going, you know, it's. Was it's, it that one or was it the Hannah Arendt? I can't even remember. No, I have the Hannah Arendt one. Okay. Which one? Eichmann in Jerusalem? Yeah. I have that one. The banality of evil? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I know all about that. I know all about that. Did you that. read it? The banality of evil or the, the Eichmann book. in Jerusalem? The book. I did read it. I, I read as much of it as I could. <laughs> be, I, di I didn't find her prose style to be, to hold me as much as I would like. No. I'm sorry that it didn't. She's no Len Dayton. Yeah, I don't know who that is, but now I'm going to read her. Him. Who? Well, it's not a page turner, but it is a good read. No, it's an important read. And not unlike many important reads, I get in about, you know, 30 pages, and I think I got it. I got it. I get it. Can I give you the background on, on, on because it doesn't often happen that I make a documentary or start making one and then it kind of fizzles out. And I do feel bad for um, eating up your time. And no, I, I enjoy talking to you. I feel, I feel you feel familiar to me. I like you. Uh, I don't know. I feel like maybe, you know, we could have, you know, have dinner or something in a sociable way. I could maybe sit with your friends. Sure. And it, it would not be a, a stretch. No. Yeah, it, that never happened either, but that's all right. You emailed me to, I think you emailed me when you knew that this was going to happen. You emailed me when you, like, maybe this was an idea that maybe you should do Mark Marin's show, and then he shot off an email a couple of weeks ago saying, hey, I didn't use that stuff. Uh, well, listen, <laughs> I'm not going to deny that, but I had enough class not to say in the email, hey, I'm sorry I haven't been in touch about why we never used your interview, but can I be on your, can I be on your podcast? No. I just said, I'm sorry. And then someone else arranged the interview to be on the podcast. Right. But my question is, if we're, if we're going to be investigative and if you're going to. But I respect, I admire you for seeing through, <laughs> <laughs> seeing through me. I didn't realize I was that transparent. I don't know if you're transparent. You now you're you're you, you know you're copping to it. Where you moments ago you were attempting to throw someone under the bus, kind of in a way, like you were like well, I had nothing to do with reaching out to you, right? That was what could have followed there. But now you're taking responsibility that somebody said to you, "You want to do Mark Maron's show?" Because we've had people on there before, and you're like, "Oh, you know." I no, no, that wasn't how it was, though. No, no. I, I, you know what it was? was like, I was like, man, I, I'm going to be promoting my movie. And, yeah. Uh, Mark Marin. I think it was also, okay, this is going to, do you want the full truth? Yeah. Why not? We're doing a you documentary. Know, I always wanted to do, I, you know, when I, when you first came on my radar when a friend of mine said, I was looking into a, a show about comedians and I was thinking about, um, it's an interesting world, this world of, uh, these people who spill their guts on stage, they transmute the angst of their lives into comic gold. Yeah. And, and that's a high wire act. And Some of us, yeah. And, and to me, that's the beginning of something interesting. Something that it embodies a kind of tension between, you know, you're turning your wound into your art. And, yeah. And what are the, that's both can be lucrative, creatively fulfilling, but potentially dangerous. And you also, you pay a price and the people around you pay a price. So I thought, I thought in the loss of intimacy. How did you, how do you flesh that out in your head? How is it potentially dangerous from your point of view? Oh, emotionally, I oh, suppose. Yeah. Destructive to relationships. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exposing of relationships. Okay. Uh, so I had it all figured out kind of intellectually. And then I was talking to a friend about it who works 
in the comedy industry, and he said, you've got to listen to Mark Maron. He does a podcast. He, he interviews all the comedians, yeah. and he, this would be perfect for you. And he also gave an amazing keynote speech at Aspen, right? On Montreal. Mon- Montreal. A few years back, yeah. Talking about how, you know, the price that you pay as a comedian slaving away, the emotional toll that it takes over the years. And, and I listened to that, and it really impressed me. And I listened to your podcast. I thought, this is amazing. Anyway... Fast forward like six months a year, we had our uh, conversation, yeah. and that didn't. Uh, and then, but it was very hard to get other people. I think two things happened. It was hard to get other people who were, who who were sort of at the level or at the level we needed them to be. Yeah, like I didn't want it to be like young guys trying to make it in comedy. I right. wanted it to have every. I wanted to have a kind of Jay Leno, Joan Rivers figure, and then the you un- know, the unknown guy who's been out there unknown, forever. Yeah, but a whole mix. Yeah. But we ended up, I don't want to embarrass any comedians, other comedians by saying who we got, but we got people who it wasn't enough to flesh it out. And so it fizzled out. And I, I did feel, you know, our interview, the one I did with you, I thought was really interesting. Um, but we I, I remember you left and I felt like, what's that guy going to do with that? Then I think, um, I secretly after that thought, God, it'd be nice to be on his podcast though. Yeah. But, you know, clearly you didn't really know any of my documentaries and in fact i think at one point you you had a little dig and i don't say that you know because yeah. i enjoy i enjoy that kind of repartee kind of humor that's close to the bone you had a little dig i think what you said was <laughs> you know are you well known in britain and i said I, I don't know i guess people see me on tv and then you said because in america no one knows who the fuck you are <laughs> i said that yeah well my manager at the time was british and she loved you yeah and why well well <laughs> That sounds a little hostile. Um, did I say it in a funny way? I didn't feel it was hostile. Did I get a laugh? I don't think I laughed. <laughs> I think some other people in the room laughed. When you were screening it and that was the end of No, the- no, I mean, I think you had a friend there, maybe called Dave, and I think he might have laughed. Dave was here? I think it wasn't in here. It was backstage at a comedy club in Pasadena when you said that. Oh. Was it? That must have been who I was doing it for. Maybe. Maybe it was Dave Anthony. I think it must have it been Dave. It was Dave Anthony, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. a... Yeah, I would have done that joke for him. I would have taken that kind of... Is that of, a joke? A painful <laughs> shot. Well, I think in the That's context... just an insult. Well, it's jarring, and it's something that you don't expect people to say, so that qualifies yeah. as a joke when you're like, oh, holy <laughs> shit, did that just happen? <laughs> a lot of jokes are like that. Oh, it's funny. Yeah. So then um, you didn't have me on the podcast, but then... Uh, I think I went on Joe Rogan's podcast. I went on a couple of times and got a great reaction. And then I thought, well, I'm not doing Marin, but I'm doing Joe Rogan. This is great. Mm -hmm. And then when I came out to do this, I thought, oh, I'll go back on Joe Rogan. And then I emailed him and that didn't seem to go anywhere. I thought, oh, wow, maybe I should try Marin again, but I don't know how to do that. He still thinks thinks I'm making a documentary about him three years later. (laughs) Well, but now I feel that on some level you have you've gotten me back. For me saying no one fucking knows you here <laughs> by saying that you did Joe's twice and and only after you didn't hear back from him, you thought, well, Marin is still a, maybe an option. So, but you didn't say it as a joke. See, you just reeled it off like it was a, an okay thing to say that Joe Rogan didn't get back to me. <laughs> he did get back, but he just said, yeah, man, let's hook it up. Yeah. And then, but then it, I awesome. didn't know what the next move was. With Joe? Yeah. Like, let's hook it up. I was like, okay. I didn't want to say like, okay, I- I'm hooking it what'd up. You, what'd you talk about on Joe's? What were you there twice for? Uh, the first time I, th- you know, Joe's seen a lot of my documentaries. Oh, well, have I you, guess that's the difference between me and Joe. Have you seen anything I've ever done? Yeah, I saw Scientology The movie. movie. That's the only thing. And then I poked around and looked at some other stuff, bits and pieces. What's the matter with you? What? What? what we can't talk now? No, like, we you, you don't think that the Scientology thing is a, your latest film is like an amalgamation, a a part of uh, the evolution of you as an artist and as a documentarian and a filmmaker and a human being. That that I watched your most recent film and everything should be there. It should all be there. I get your personality. I, I get what makes you, uh, you know, uh, uh, an interesting person to watch. I get the style. It's probably why I feel familiar to you because you're so good at being a kind of like, um, like a, a non-threatening, you know, kind of like I can talk to this guy, spongy guy. Mm-hmm. 
right? Spongy guy. Yeah, I, yeah. Okay, fair enough. With, no, so, and you're witty, but you, you, you're very, like, you, it's like a lot of times <laughs> you're witty in the way that it's what's unsaid, you know, the quiet wit yeah. of just letting things unfold, which yeah. is a great skill for a documentarian. But I know that you've been doing it a long time, sure. and I wanted to ask you, I've, I have questions. Wait, why does everyone think you got to see everything to have a conversation? Uh, you know, you know what I've done in my life. I'll tell you what I've done. That's a good point. And I haven't seen many of your things either. No, you, I mean, you follow me around once. But I listen to a lot of the podcasts. Sure, sure. Which and and, very and good, okay. By the way. Well, thank you. And I I enjoyed your film a lot. Thank and, you. And I and I I like your work ethic. You seem to do a lot. Thank you. Yeah. So when you like when you say to me like you had this kernel for an idea like you've done documentaries about Nazis. Yep. Pedophiliacs. Mm-hmm. Porn, so the Westboro Baptist Church. Oh yeah. So when you have this idea, like with me, the the charge was the High Wire Act the, of comedians, the liability, the the risk. I saw it as part of a um, almost of a piece with a few other docs that I'd done. One was about the porn industry, and one was about wrestling, and then there's another about gangster rap, and I, and they, each in their way is about the way. Um, People, they're, they're almost theme parks in which people play versions of themselves, right? And end up um, almost approaching their real selves. And the line between the real and the fake is blurred. I mean, in the porn industry, what's always interesting is how, you know, they're in a sense fictional characters, but the the physical act, the anatomy is real. And the biggest challenge in porn is for the men is to keep their erections. They right. have medicine for that. Well, they do now, but I, I did this in, this was in 96. So when it's, I made, okay. This so was pre Viagra. Uh huh. Viagra. And, um, uh, so it's that strangeness of having to impersonate something, but also for it to be real. They have to have real sex and, and it's right. not always easy to do. In wrestling, they're having fake fights in which they get really hurt. And in gangster rap, it's about this strange gray area between they're supposed to keep it real, right? That's the phrase. Yeah. They're supposed to have street cred, street credentials. They can't pretend to have sold drugs and then rap about selling drugs. That's a big no-no. Right. But it's also supposed to be kind of show business, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, and I see that in, in comedy, it seemed to me you've got this same thing where you're playing a version of yourself, but it impinges on real life. With me, it does. But maybe they're not all not all the cases. No, I think that there are plenty of comics that do jokes, but usually their disposition is something that evolves out of their real life, their point of view, perhaps. But actually taking your real life out there and working through it comedically is, you know, not everybody's cup of tea. I mean, to different degrees. Mm. You know, I don't know that, you know, Jerry Seinfeld is ruining his relationship no. in any way. No. <laughs> no. But when when did it start though? Like you what happened? You where would you go to college? Uh Oxford University. So that, well, that's a good one, right? Yeah. And were you involved in uh w- were you involved in the comedy troupe? No. No, I I wrote some comedy just for for uh magazines and stuff, but I like was Like satire pieces? <clears throat> I did I was into rap at the time and I used to do I did a, a kind of parody a gangster rap parody I remember I used to do a little cartooning and so I did some comic strips no, very just little side thing I was a pretty serious student so most of my energy was directed into getting a good degree Well Oxford is like uh, that's the big school that would be like the Harvard of there yeah. and you know you got to be pretty sharp to get in there Yeah so you were a good student all the way through I was a good student all the way through. I always took my studies. I skipped a year at uh, school because I was considered to be intelligent, and they put so they fast tracked me. But I had a little gang that I was. I before Oxford, I went to a school called Westminster School. It's the fee-paying kind of posh London school, which is uh, where a lot of media type people send their kids there. Like who? I don't know. Like uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, the names probably wouldn't mean that much to you. Anyway, well, I don't. Maybe okay. Oh, I understand the point. So, so, so my friends there. Actually, the the, the lasting friendships I formed were with people at Westminster, and yeah. there were a couple of guys called um, Joe Cornish, who became a film director, and Adam Buxton, who's a comedian. I know that guy. Yeah. I know that name. Podcaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Does turned he... him on to you, and he sort of started his own uh, podcast in the UK. And did, did I help him? Did I influence him? 
I would say so, yeah. yeah. He wants to interview you. In the UK? Uh, he's coming over here next week. He didn't He didn't reach out. He did. He did? Yeah. On Twitter? Well, we, should we be talking about this now? Why not? It's very inside baseball. But would you stop it if we were in one of your documentaries? I'd be like, we're not using this bit. <laughs> It's so boring. <laughs> All right. So you're, but here, tell me about Oxford because it's one of those things like I've only talked to one other person. I can't even remember if he went to Oxford or Cambridge. What's the difference? It's, it's Harvard and Yale, man. Oh, so it's okay. Same level. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know that I've talked to anybody from Oxford. What, what, what were you studying there? History. Oh, so that's, that's big deal. Well, it's just another subject. I don't know. I mean, I studied English. Some people study philosophy, but history, what, what, what was your focus? Is that how it works? Not so much. I mean, you do it, you range pretty widely. I did narrow it into the 17th century scientific movement for one semester. Yeah. So if you want to go Galileo, I'm ready. So that was the thing, huh? Descartes, now what, Robert Boyle. Now, what part of your brain, like, like, if I'm thinking broadly in an intellectual way, you know, what, what were the lessons? What was the drive? You said, I'm going to study history. So what did you glean? from uh, the the arc of humanity from studying history at Oxford that 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 enlightened you well you know if you if you're talking scientific revolution specifically uh you know one of the most eminent uh historians of science was a guy called Robert Kuhn and he he had the theory of the paradigm shift if you like and the idea he that, invented that saying that concept oh, yeah okay. which, which concept not a saying <laughs> if you like saying <laughs> Uh, and it's the idea that, you know, the history of science does not move in a kind of orderly, linear, progressive fashion. It, it, it kind of, it, there is progress there, but it happens in kind of fits and yeah. starts and people work within a template and the template may last for a hundred years or, or several hundred years. And it starts to buckle. And then it buckles under the weight of, uh, data that can't be assimilated into it. Right. But it is a semi kind of relativistic idea. The, right. This idea that you have, you know, before you have an understanding of something, there's a pre-existing interpretive framework. And I think, you know, among other things, um, that's a helpful concept. I mean, I suppose more generally, it's the idea of the march of folly. You know, I, I mean, I like to think there's progress, but I, when, when you reflect on the level of um, just sh sheer idiocy, nastiness, brutality. The human element. The weirdness of the culture, you know? Yeah, the human <laughs> element and the, and the, and the kind of, preside, the sort of presiding uh, wrongheadedness of the human sure. condition. Yeah, the, 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 the shaky part <laughs> yeah. of all progress is the human element, which hasn't changed much. No. So the repercussions of... All those things, the follies, the flaws, the uh, malignant or uh, or benign evil of uh, people, you know, and the seven deadlies, greed, yeah. lust, well, the sure. list, uh, you know, they, they have the same implications on culture to some degree, uh, though the possibilities of everything being destroyed have escalated. Absolutely. <laughs> and I didn't, around that time, although it wasn't part of my studies, I remember, did you ever read a book called The Ghost in the Machine by Arthur Kersler? Mm -mm. And it's, it's basically, uh, it starts as a look at different forms of, uh, understanding human psyche, starting with behaviorism. But he, 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 he begins to talk about human evolution and the way in which the human brain, I don't even know if this is even considered scientifically kind of tenable now, yeah. but his idea was that we've kind of accreted different uh concentric layers of the brain and, and and you know in the cerebellum is where a lot of our rational thinking is but underneath it inescapably is the engine and, and the engine is the amygdala which is basically the like, lizard brain the lizard brain and and it's whatever you do in in life that will somehow be calling the shots yeah and uh and and it's a really odd book because all of this is quite plausible. And then you arrive at the lo last chapter and he says, and the only way out of this is we all have to undergo lobotomies. <laughs> and he's quite serious. He has a program for we're all supposed to kind of line up and have our brains fixed. Com complete lobotomies or just partial? Uh, partial. Uh, right. Uh, maybe a little, maybe put a, a valve in between yeah. the, the lizard brain and the rest of it. Yeah. There's some sort just of. Just uh, take a little uh, ice cream scoop and scoop a bit take out. A, a little bit of that out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Well, I, it sounded like a good theory. Even that sounds good, but I, I think it'd be hard to legislate something like that. But I think they might have done it. I mean, you you know, most people, a lot of people don't get out of their house and they don't talk to other people and they still feel that they're very well connected with everybody. Hmm. Now, the great illusion, the illusion will Are serve. Are we talking about social media? Sure. We just were talking about reptile brains and now it's social media. I guess that does connect, though. It's all, um, it's this... Uh, Taps in. It's a kind of the, you know, it's rats who have uh, their brains wired up to electrodes that mean if they jump on the switch, yeah, they keep giving themselves orgasms. Right. Well, yeah. Uh, and then uh, they just do it until they die. Well, orgasms, like, I think that can be uh, a broad idea, like orgasm, the hate rush, the shame rush, mm -hmm. the... Uh, the Trump rush. Yeah. Well, th those all fit under that umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a broad umbrella of, of many of the, but you know, some people love them. Uh, those people concern me, but that's not our, our journey here. I so, can segue nicely from that to, um, Dianetics, by the way. I know, but what I'd like to do though, because you seem to think that I don't have a handle on your entire career is what, uh, after you get out of Oxford, you know, how do you decide what is the, the motivation? Cause documentary to me, when they're done well, and I think you do do them well. And you you do a, a sort of gonzo documentary mm -hmm. where you infuse yourself. Yes. That you become a, a, a person. Participant. Out. Yeah, you are, are part of it uh, in a big way, as is Michael Moore, who you worked with, correct? Yes, I did, yes. Did, now, had you done work before TV Nation? Not on TV, no. I, I, I left university. I have a, My dad's American. I had a U.S. passport. I went to... Um, to live in America in 91 when I left and worked in local journalism for a, a year. Print? Yes, in San Jose. So California. you were, you were, you, did you go to graduate school for journalism? No. No. I you, just leapt in and, and learned on the job. I started with an internship. I, for three months, I worked sort of for free. Who, what, when, where, and why? Yeah. The inverted pyramid. Is that what it is? That's what they say. Like the important stuff at the top. I mean, oh, oh I didn't know that one. Yeah. See, now look what we learned. It's uh, it's uh, yeah, it's all part of the job. And you were doing local news, L literally city council reports and right. um, new plan for traffic system in w downtown in San Jose. And then wow, for, yeah. So that have you, you know, been that, to San Jose? Sure. So that was uh, that was sort of like you know that that was the that was the tough times. That was the you're cutting your teeth. Uh, but you know the, the why San Jose. I, I was living in Boston doing odd jobs, and I think... That's a hell of a commute. It is a long way, but I just wanted to get out and away. I wanted, I think I wanted to get away from uh, anything I knew. I wanted to stay in America, but I didn't know where I wanted to go. I was looking for a job. I applied for a whole... I literally went to the, the Boston Library. There was a book called The Directory of Internships. There was a chapter on... Um, Newspaper internships. I applied to the Rocky Mountain News, the Times Picayune, the Boston Phoenix, uh, uh, and a bunch of others, and San Jose Metro, and that's where I ended up. Where were you living in Boston? I think is it called Boylston? On uh, Boylston Street. Yeah. Yeah. And you just picked nice. there. Yeah. It no. Well, my dad's from Boston, so oh, okay. it was local. Oh, okay. So you you pack up and you go to not one of the the gems of the Bay Area. No. <laughs> it has its own kind of ch middle American charms. Definitely. Though. It's absolutely... Um, I just had a, a flood there. It's bad. It's the least pretentious city, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like a kind of antithesis to San Francisco. Definitely. And and I, for me, it was a great place. It was, it was, it was like uh, an immersion into middle America and, you know, in all its banality, but also... Um, the kind of whatever you want to call it, the sprawl, the weirdness. It has, you know, on the fringes, it's got hippiedom in Santa Cruz, the mountains around it. You've got, you've got a little bit of everything. Yeah, but you do definitely have a kind of like mall, kind of American, you know. Uh, the malls are bigger than the downtown. Yeah. Like it's one of those places where the malls have kind of taken over like rogue organs yeah. sucking the life out of the downtown. That's all the country, yeah. And it's also one of those places that's semi-fictional in the sense of, they say they're the 11th largest city in the, in the nation, right? Yeah. But it's all a fiction created by huge boundaries being drawn around sure, it. Sure, sure. Yeah, you don't go there and go like, look at this amazing city. 
No, no. <laughs> and they're saying, well, we're bigger than San Francisco. And, and you think, well, I don't think so. <laughs> but uh, I, I, so I was there for a year and then I, got, I went to work on Spy Magazine. Oh. And uh, did that for about a year. In New York? In New York, yeah. Towards the end? Yes, it was d- the lean years of Spy. It was just every month it would be slightly... Is that where you, you got your edge, your tone? Because oh. it's a little, it's a little more comedy uh, centric. It was, it was where I felt m- more able to kind of, I suppose, you know, use humor. I, I mean, I, I, I guess it was. I've always felt, you know, I've always had, a, I think, pretty good sense of humor, sense of the absurdity of life. Yeah, I, I always want to laugh at you. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I th- no, no. I mean, like you have that disposition. Like, yeah. I, like I'm, I'm always kind of half waiting for a laugh. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Is that on purpose, though? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't even know now. I don't know. <laughs> but you I, know, I, I do serious. I, yeah. I've done serious stuff. I mean, I've, I've been on a sort of anyway. I've, I also do the, the. I do all the moods, and and actually, um. You know, in the movie, you 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 can see that it's no, definitely, no, no. I'm stuff. not saying you're a clown. But either way, I I remember uh, Spy Magazine folded. It literally went belly up while I was working there, and and I got a lifeline in the form of friends who uh, had been working there and had had known Michael Moore, had worked on his pilot for TV Nation, yeah. and they called. They went to work with Michael, and then they called me and said Michael would like to meet you. Basically. The TV Nation was being co-funded by the BBC, and the BBC had said to Michael, it would be great if you could have a, a kind of a British guy yeah. on your show. Right. And and that's where I stepped in. And that's where you first started doing, you know, on-camera reporting. Yeah. Yes. And now those segments, which I do kind of vaguely remember, were were produced, and they were all, right? They, I mean, you, you yeah. had to lay them out. Yes. You had an agenda. It wasn't, it was not quite daily show style, but it was close. It was sort of proto-daily show, but it had a little, it was a little more grounded. Mm-hmm. And so they were, um, they weren't so much making fun of the form. Right. Of TV, right? It was uh, it was more like mini documentaries, but I was clearly slightly a slightly ludicrous figure as a kind of correspondent on the show. Not so much deliberately. I mean, I, one of the things I credit Michael with is um, hiring me and sort of recognizing that I was, you know, like my TV unreadiness was an asset. Like I really was trying to be kind of to do a good job, and I had one jacket that I bought secondhand, I think, in Boston. So I turned up thinking, like, I'm looking like more or less like a correspondent. But looking back, I looked like a hopeless sort of <laughs> shambolic figure. And, and, and I went out and interviewed Ku Klux Klan's people, um, millennial religious groups. And, and something about m- my s- geeky, whatever it is, sort of slightly um, awkward, ill at ease quality that seemed yeah. to make it funny um and my kind of cerebral thing right. whatever it is was a, was a good contrast with guys in, you know in arkansas michael Lowe, you know talking about sure we're the new clan and all this kind of thing right well well that's well that's interesting because like you know not intentionally you you developed an on-screen personality yes that sort of probably stuck with you a bit uh, I guess so. Yeah, I often think that I didn't really realize what worked, you know? Like, I, I, I used to overthink stuff and think, oh, it would be funny if I did this. And always that was stuff that never worked. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've written a great joke. If I could just, if you'll shut up for long enough, I can get my zinger off. That stuff never worked. But somehow if I'd walk into a house and trip over something, mm-hmm. and that was always pretty funny. Yeah, well, there's, that's never not funny. Or I looked, fr- or, he, or the clan guy would go, uh, now steady on now, don't burn me on this. And I, you could see me looking all frightened. Yeah. Not deliberately. And that was kind of funny. Well, what is, so was it there where, you know, because it does seem like you deal with, I, and I don't know, like, I don't know the show that I, uh, the one you did in, for the BBC. The I did weird, a few weird weekends. Yeah. It was on Bravo over here as well. Yeah. There were about 20 episodes. But it seems like. It's on Netflix now. You can catch it on Netflix here. Okay. I'll do post research. Watch the wrestling one. Okay. Well, uh, why? You're not going to watch it. No, I will. I like you. I, I'm just busy. I know you are. I'm just you, kidding. And, and like, you know, this came up quick and I Did knew- you read Sam Kenodis' book? I mean, that takes about 12 hours to read the book. Which book? The one called um, Dreamland. Yeah, I did. See, that would have taken about 12 hours and you haven't got 
50 minutes. But you watched my movie. I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm giving you a hard time. No, you I should. Know. You should. You know, I deserve it. I deserve it because but like, when you care, you put the time in. Well, I watch a Scientology point. movie. It's just like to catch to catch up. No, that's fair the, enough. The, the Kenona's book. I didn't see that coming, and I didn't book him. I booked him after I read it. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't like. It wasn't. I was like, "Where does this guy live?" Because like, I I get a lot of books, you know, for they send them to me, you know, uh, publishing houses. So like, I just that one stuck. It's it sat around. I'm like, I got to look at that because the, the subject, the opiate epidemic. And then I started reading it, and I was like, what the fuck? You know? And I said that when I watched Scientology movie. Thank you. Yeah. It's kind of your it's your saying. That's well, I mean, but, you know, the Canonis thing is, like, this is important that he pulled together all this information, not unlike you did. But my my, but the point there was, like, like I just read this this Altamont book that I got months ago. And, I, I again, I get hundreds of books. And some of them I'm like, that one I think is going to be something. And sometimes I'm right. And the, the book on Altamont I read... About a documentary, but Give like, me shelter. yeah, yeah. Uh, or about the great, con but, great doc. right? But this is more about the actual concert. You know, w w how did that? How did it happen? Really? Yeah, oh yeah, but um, but yeah. So like that was a fluke thing, you know. Yeah. But you know, when when we booked this a few weeks ago, I you know I definitely sat and watched the film, Thank and I, and I'm going to enjoy going back and watching. But. W what I'm asking you now, just you know, outside of the series that are on Bravo or whatever I can watch on on uh, Netflix. Netflix, is that early on you seem to have developed this fascination for um, pseudo religious groups, mm -hmm. racist groups, groups that are sort of ideologically grounded and serve a purpose to people that may or may not be good. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes, if you like. Yeah, that's fair enough. And, uh, you know, because I, you know who I've talked to? John Ronson. Yes, I heard that one. Yeah, I only read one of his books and I, and I had a, I forced myself to. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really have to force yourself? No, once I read it though, like, cause like, you know, I, I liked him. I read the psychopath test yeah. and then I read the other one. I read the one about shame. Yeah. Is it shaming? And, and, so you've been publicly shamed and them is also very good. Right. Well, I haven't gotten to that one mm. or the other one. I, I, I'd like to read them. That's about these people that we're talking about right now. Alex Jones is in it. I saw, I think I saw a doc with the, is, did he do a doc? Did Ronson do a doc? Yes, Who he did? did. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah. But, um, but I like John. I met his son, worked for me for a month or two. No kidding. Yeah. Joel did? Yeah. He worked for you. Kind of, yeah. He was here and he didn't know what he was going to be doing. And, you know, he, <laughs> I feel like he worked for me for a little while. He's a good kid. John's, uh, super talented. He's funny. He, you guys remind me of each other. I like you guys. He used to say that, um, he used to say that we were like, uh, a conjoined twin and yeah. that one of us had to die in order that the other should live. <laughs> Well, I hope you guys are past that. Yeah, I think we're over that now. So what, what compelled you then? You know, I mean, like, I get the porn, I get the wrestling, I get the the rapper, I get, like, well, pedophilia, that's a whole other place. It's all to do with um, the human psyche, either things that cause us to self-sabotage, to behave mm -hmm. in a way that, you know, the rational part of our brain knows is dangerous and destructive. Although, arguably, it is rational to attempt to, you know, we're emotional creatures and it is rational to attempt to be the hero of your own life, to embrace danger, to embrace um, embarrassment. You know, all of that, it sort of, in a certain way, does make sense. But I, I'm intrigued by decisions that go to the core of who we are, you know. Yeah. Uh, like, why would you, uh, you know, utopianism. In Scientology, you have people who've committed for tens of years to living frugally because they believe they're part of a millennia's old, millennia old space opera right yeah as written or as discovered by old ron hubbard i mean you could say that's wrong-headed and bizarre or you could say that's hugely enriching and admirable well have you re ever read the denial of death no i have th that's one i struggled with ernest becker well that's the have like you read that yeah it's one of my favorite books changed my life but like what you're talking about that suspension of disbelief in order to feel part of something bigger than you mm. is is almost you know existentially human uh, from day one that this need to define your life i imagine if you read joseph campbell or any sort of you know exploration of of primitive religion and then on through the rest of it that what what gives your life purpose mm. 
Um, you know, you must feel some part of something bigger than yourself, whether it's a, a, a fascist movement or a football team. You know, there's a, a, a variety of ways to to connect like that. But uh, but it is a, it is, you know, it seems arguably and, and somewhat proven that it is a, a, a human. It's almost genetic. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, that addresses exactly what you're saying. Yeah, neurology, you know, and there are, if you strap someone up to a um, machine and, you know, there are parts of the brain that religious belief activates. And there is, I think, very little that you can, you know, we can do about uh, that, that, that dimension, you know, that anatomical dimension that we, that many of us share. Yeah, well, it seeks to, like, I imagine that given that we're these conscious animals as a, or, or, or self-aware animals that, you know, in order not to be, I think that the idea of the denial of death and, and those type of thinkers is that to not feel terrified constantly or, or painfully aware of your own mortality, uh, you better, you better lock into something. Mm. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, when you're, I mean, and, and, and then there's this tension, this pull between the kind of, the, you know, the pull of being connected to your kids, let's say, but being in the Westboro Baptist Church and your kids leave and, and you want to, uh, stick with this, uh, cosmic plan that you're part of, which involves picketing the funerals of dead soldiers with offensive anti-gay placards. But you also have this pull of like, I'm not allowed to see my kid, but I want to see my kid. And I find that sort of angst, um, that's sort of what it's all about in a way, getting to those places where uh, people are involved in the deepest kinds of stress and anxiety. Struggle. Struggle, inner turmoil. Inner in turmoil. A kind of baff- in a kind of baffling way. Or sometimes it's just... Why is it baffling? Because it defies reason? Yes, because actually, so for example, if you take addiction, right? Yeah. I've done a few that circle around um, the city that it was addicted, city to, addicted meth. to crystal meth. More recently, I did one called Drinking to Oblivion. People who just have binges of drinking vodka around the clock until they either kind of start vomiting blood and die or end up in hospital and get rehab but, and detox and then go in a cycle of doing it again over the years until. That fascinates you. Well, yes, I suppose it does. And because in a way, um, you're talking to someone who, on the face of it, is r- as rational as you are, someone who uh, is, see, appears to be well-adjusted, thoughtful, uh, have everything going yeah. for them, you know, isn't just a kind of, uh, I don't know, d- really damaged, isn't just a sort of derelict in the street. We were talking to professional uh, people, you know, people like you or I. And then you're saying, like, well, why, why... You know, it's so. It would seem to be so obvious that uh, don't do that. There's a fork in the road. Like you go down that road, and you it leads to addiction, loss of all relationships, and death. You go down the other road, you have a nice life, and um, you can keep your job, keep your relationships. What, what, so what's stopping you from doing that? What did you find out? As somebody who quit drinking many years ago, I'd like to know what you know. Somebody who clearly doesn't have that problem gleaned from uh, this investigation. I, th- you know. It's the it's clear that it's not clear is the bottom line because I don't think there is an easy one size fits all explanation for why. But do you believe that it you know, it might be some sort of biological liability that yeah. is genetic and I'm open somewhat to that. behavioral? You know, I, I I think that I mean I'm not a geneticist or you know neurologist, but I would think so. I I tend to think that. Uh, genetic explanations. I mean, I, I don't know if they're fashionable or unfashionable, but I don't have a big problem with, with the idea that well, that could be passed on. Much as I think pedophilia, you know, it used to be fashionable to reach for sort of Freudian, oh, it's the upbringing, even with, in the cases of something like um, autism or being on the autistic sure. spectrum. It was said that, oh, it was the, it was the withholding mother, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, but then it became clear, you know what, it's not the parents. The, the parents have done nothing well, yeah, Untold. and that would indicate a uh, paradigm shift. Yeah, there's a paradigm shift, and you're working with a different, and it's suddenly, okay, it's not environmental, or it's not exclusively. Yeah. And by the same token, pedophilia, when I was at this uh, hospital that treated uh, or attempted to rehabilitate, um, if that's the right term, pedophiles, after they'd been discharged from prison but were still considered dangerous, right? Mm-hmm. They put in a maximum security hospital in Coalinga in Central California, yeah. only a few hours' drive from here. And it was said to me, you know, the received wisdom 
is often, oh, cycle of abuse. They were abused as children, and now they're passing on the cycle. Mm. Almost as though that appeals to our sense of, um, you know, I don't know. People seem to find that an appealing, almost a kind of poetically appealing. Well, oh. it, it engages, uh, uh, it, it justifies empathy. Yeah, and and it, it kind of thinks like these aren't people who were damaged to begin with, but it's part of the viciousness of pedophilia that it creates more pedophiles. It's, yeah, like victims. A it's, a, it's like the victims of pedophilia. Yeah, you know, go on to and what'd you learn? It was explained to me that it's at least as valid, if not more valid, to see it as a sexual orientation, a dangerous predatory one, but one that is uh, uh, genetic and exists much as other sexual orientations do, you know, in a way that can be uh, rationally, you know, attempted to be countered, that you can kind of counsel and support positive behaviors, but it isn't going anywhere. Right. It's a compulsion that's... Uh, that Just like, you know, you look at a, a, a magazine, you or I might, I don't know what, you know, maybe you wouldn't. Right. Don't know. But, you know, just a physical reaction. That so... That guy's uh, lobotomy idea, not bad. Yeah. Yeah, because that goes all the way back to the uh, lizard brain. Yeah. So they it's say a- that actually, I met a guy who was in rehabilitation and he was, um, he was so serious about his rehab that he had volunteered to be castrated, right? Yeah. And, and which was not particularly recommended as part of the therapy. But I don't even think that helps. Huh. So, well, I think what, what, seems thematic in what you're doing is that you know when we talk about the the folly of history and the in and the human component that remains forever flawed and dangerous to some degree but yet some of that some of those flaws compel people to do great things is that yeah i would imagine that you know when you talk to ku klux klan or you talk to to, to metzger the nazi not unlike you just said to me about uh, the alcoholic, is that like, well, this is a guy that, you know, you could have a cup of coffee with, Mm -hmm. yet he has these horrible compulsions or these, you know, malignant beliefs that are are, are almost uh, obviously inhumane Mm -hmm. and and dangerous. So what is that? How do you get from uh, those are nice shoes to I want all the Jews dead? Yes. Right? Right. Yeah. Two lumps in your coffee and then, yeah. yeah let's kill them all. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, um, that wasn't the funny bit. The, uh. Two lumps in your coffee and then Chablinka is not funny? You can tell me that that doesn't register as something you said to be witty? Take it for what it is. <laughs> I, um, but, you know, that's, but basically you've kind of, I guess, boiled down the inner tension like the the, the the kind of commonality that exists in everything I do which isn't necessarily even intrinsic to the subject is about my relationship with the subject which is uh, people who are uh, I- involved in something untoward controversial or borderline you know awful dangerous and then I I get to like them and they slightly like me you know and you have this strange uh feeling of like well, i don't know what to do with this now like yeah h- how how am i supposed to feel now that i kind of feel sort of a little bit of a rapport with um this guy who or this person who does something terrible well right so that 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 is your part in this yeah and that is like that is the risk that you take and that is what you know that that is part of the genius of getting these people to appear and be the humans they are, despite the fact that they're awful hmm. or or troubled or 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 doing something that you would never do yeah. or you think is wrong, but yes. you don't you don't necessarily put that in there. You let that speak for itself because that's what the documentary does. Yes, yeah, pretty much. I mean, sometimes you have to. Yeah, put your foot down. Put it in there. Say that uh, I'm I, not for this. <laughs> I try and have a conver- I did a show about um, sex offenders who live in in in, in an industrial area of su- southern LA. Yeah, and um, it was about kind of li- sort of staying there over the course of a few months, visiting and getting to know these guys. And it was this weird thing where I I, I started to like them a little bit, and then in some cases I didn't know quite what they'd done, and in other cases I did. And the strangeness of I, it was a tricky one because it feels as though even beyond uh, Nazis, you know, most of which at this point is theoretical. 
right, in this country. I mean, it's dreadful, but there are no kind of Nazis who are in power and able to implement any part of that vision. Well, well until... Well, okay, put a footnote on that. <laughs> but whereas you've got people who are, um, you know, sex offenders and, and in particular pedophiles is viewed as um, the, the ugliest kind yeah. of psychological compulsion. And, right. and if you had, you know, there are literally apps that exist there's one called Offender Locator, dot, yeah. you know, something. Sure. Where you can track in California, around the U.S., where everyone, where, you know, is there a sex offender near me right now? Sure. You know, where do they live? And let's see a little picture of them. And so in spending time with those guys, um, you suddenly think, hang on, this guy seems like maybe he's kind of okay and maybe we should give him a second chance. And then you find out, oh, he abused his three children. And then, and then it's the strangest of, uh, well, what, okay, what do I do with that now? I don't hire him as a babysitter. That's clear. But, uh, am I able to call him a kind of, um, friend or, 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 or not really? And so I, I, I mentioned that because that was one where there was a, a great deal of nervousness at the channel, at the BBC. And it was felt, we went after I'd made it and, and more or less delivered it. It kind of went up the channel a bit, and they said, you know, there's a couple of bits where you're shaking hands with some of these guys, and and we're not sure that's going to um, – you really want that in there. You humanize them too much. Yeah, like you just take out the bit where you shake hands and say, hey, nice to see you, you know. And on the one hand, you say, God, that's ludicrous, you know. Why? Because they're so unclean. And then on the other hand, they're trying to look out for me and, and not make me appear to be some kind of – I don't know. Yeah, so this is like... What was your word? Spongy. Uh, they don't a, want me to look that spongy. Well, it's, a, it's a grand experiment for you to uh, to uh, uh, implement personal boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> try, and, try and sort of say, actually, you know, um, I, obviously I can't be your, you know, Yeah, your we can't hang out after yeah. this because you, you molested all of your children. Yeah. But, you know, that, that you make a nice tuck, cup of tea. And, uh, like, I hope you don't do that anymore. Yeah, exactly. So... The Scientology film, like I've I've watched one other Scientology documentary, and it actually I think involved one of the your main guy. Yes, it, uh, going clear. Yeah, yeah. What's your main guy's name? Marty Rathbun. So Marty, his real Rath name is Mark Rathbun. Yeah, and you know, so you decided to take this on Scientology, but you know, I thought that the device uh, was very interesting, the Good. casting device. Thank you, and and in fact, uh, it was partly. I wouldn't say lifted, but influenced by a documentary called The Act of Killing. Did you ever see that? No. Which was made by a director called Joshua Oppenheimer. And he, it's about, uh, genocide, it's not, it's about mass killings in Indonesia in the late sixties. And he get, he, he gets some of these killers 20 or 30 years on. And he, 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 under his aegis, they start reenacting in, in a film within the film some of their, the killings that they did. I heard about this. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's a fascinating doc. I totally recommend it. And, and it becomes a therapeutic process almost. And they're not just depicting how they did what they did, but they start to unpick themselves and, 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 and begin to have questions about, um, well, it's, it's implied that it, they, they are be beginning a process of, uh, recovery. Well, that was interesting about, about your main guy, Marty or Mark, was that, you know, once you cast Escavage, is that? Miscavige. Miscavige, the head of Scientology, and you cast some adepts and people and the room where you're sort of fleshing out, fleshing out these, these stories about these practices that revolve around the head, the current head of Scientology. And that, you know, from him, by placing him in that situation, which I imagine he didn't expect to be placed in, he was able to be like, help you in the casting, yeah. say that's the guy, and then run through these things and go like, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. And then you kind of start to see his sort of like disposition. Yeah. Like, because you're sort of like, well, how this, like you said, like how this guy do these things that he supposedly did. And now he's like constantly followed by these Scientologists who see him as an enemy and everything else. But by creating this second reality of this movie with these actors, you know, the guy who played Mescovej was great, like yes. as an actor. Terrific. Like, you know, I'm, I, I had, yeah, I had a, a bunch of feelings during it. I'm like, well, well, this is a good reel for mm. these people. It's a good acting job. Yeah. And, and that, the, 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 like a quarter or a half of the documentary is how these actors handle this situation. Yeah. And then the, then the act, then Marty, you know, taking them through these Scientology rituals, you start to see how they could work 
because the actors have to sort of commit to them and how easy it is to go from, you know, performing this piece in this strange situation to seeing how, of, of course, people would go for this mm. on some level, right? Yeah. And then, but the odd thing that happened while I was watching the documentary with, you know, you trying to get access to that area where... Uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, the base, gold base out near Hemet. Right. And then, you know, the the other documentary crew. Mm -hmm. And then the, 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 the other powerful one was the two older Scientologists yeah. who showed up. Was that, uh, like, I got the feeling that, like, wow, they're really on their last legs. Really? Well, yeah, I got the feeling that these tactics that they use to intimidate, you know, outside of the, the reputed lawsuits and whatever, um, are really kind of tired. Yes. Like there was something about, you know, like noticing the lighting on the fence and that how sort of uh, dated mm. some of these security practices were and how, you know, uh, ridiculous the second documentary crew that wouldn't talk to you, that they actually thought they were engaging in protocol. Yeah. Yeah. And because you're who you are and Marty is who he is and you see that, you know, from his distance from the church at this point uh, and what he had gone through with them, that all of this protocol uh, seems desperate and ineffective. I would agree up to a point. I mean, I think partly they're working with a playbook that dates back 60 years. Yeah. You know, which is and everything they do is um, has to conform to. um what L. Ron Hubbard laid out. So it's literally things like, um, and, and Marty once told me about this. So Hubbard wrote reams of stuff, not just books, but policy statements about how certain things are done. So he said the best thing for cleaning windows is vinegar. Yeah. Now, Windex, right, is probably the best thing or something like it. No, vinegar is good. But, but he, but because Hubbard said vinegar, they have to use vinegar. It and, becomes ritualized. And Hubbard said, if media come after you, you have to, or if suppressive people come after you, you have to confront and shatter them. You have to investigate them and, and destroy them utterly or whatever it is. And so that's, whether you like it or not, that's how, that's the rules, you know. But that's also like, uh, uh, a, 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 a tactic of maintaining power, period. Mm. Right. In what way? You gotta keep the mind fuck going. Yes. And you've got it's a terrorism. You've got a totalizing vision of, uh, you've got a, a world in which, no middle ground is admitted. It's only us and them. You know, and that to me was the most striking thing about Scientology in a way. And well, there was, there were several, but that was one of them. It's that concept of we have all the answers. No one else has any of the answers. And, uh, it's up to us to kind of make sure our answers not just survive, but are kind of, uh, sort of succeed against the others. And, and, and if I learned, I mean, among other things, I learned, what was surprising is like the degree to which they hate psychiatrists is astonishing. Like they absolutely like they have. That's the thing that drives them more nuts. If you're even related, they have to anti, a psychiatrist. Anti psychiatry museums. Yes, but beyond that, you know, that was a, one of the big issues that they had with Tom Cruise's wife, Nicole Kidman. Right, Nicole Kidman's father is a psychiatrist. That was seen as a major issue for them. What do you think that? What, what do you think the threat of psychology is to Scientology, which is, as you describe it, a totalitarian mm. uh, vision, really? Like you know, beyond the religious vision, when you talk about the, it the way you just talked about it, this was a a, a design for global domination. You know, Hubbard, when he came up with Dianetics, he sent it to the Ameri American Medical Board and, or whoever the relevant authority was. And he said, I've got this great, you know, it's the greatest discovery in mental health. And they said, this is, this is absolute pish. You know, we have no interest in being any part of it. So he felt rejected. And so that was, I think that probably laid the groundwork for his hatred of the psychiatric establishment. By their own description, they see psychiatrists and psychologists as usurpers, people who have, under the auspices of doing medical work, attempted to treat spiritual matters. They see that as a as a usurpation of, um, you know, religion. And well, well, I think analytical psychology is vulnerable to that. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. The trouble is that if you go to a, psycho a, a Scientologist and, uh, you know, and you're having a psychotic break, right... Uh, they will show you the door and say, you know what, I don't think we can help you. And at that point, who do you go and see? 
If you're having a psychotic break within Scientology. Or outside Scientology. If you go to Scientologists Because right now, you're having a psychotic they, And say, um, uh, I'd love to join up. And they say, what's your history? Well, I had an episode and they, you know, I thought I was a, a poached egg briefly. Uh, and, and that lasted about two weeks and they sent me to a, a mental hospital. But other than that, I've been fine. They will say, get on your bike, mate. Yeah. Well, I found that the arc in the thing about Marty, who is your centerpiece, and you know the you know what he's dealing with and what he's up against being a traitor, uh, and also uh, the guy who's revealing them. That you, I think you did you know build a relationship with him, and you did get a sense of of where he sort of buckles. Who who Marty yeah. does? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that works in the film is that is the fact that Marty is not a kind of single minded anti Scientology guy. Like he both sees parts of it as poisonous and dangerous, but he's also kind of defensive of aspects of Scientology. Well, there's a lot of people like that who are pre-Scientology or no longer Scientologists. Even William Burroughs, you know, in his examination of Dianetics, found elements that I don't think are uh, totally unique, except yeah. maybe in language, that were helpful. Yeah, he saw merit in it, and uh, and, and and but with Marty, it goes beyond. See, I mean, he saw aspects of the tech as being therapeutic and helpful, uh, but he also defends aspects of the kind of Spartan and militaristic world-changing culture. You know, the fact that there was a degree of physical, or allegedly there was a degree of physical violence at the int base, Marty is ambivalent about. He sees it kind of. Um, as toxic and dangerous, and then sometimes he would say, "You know, what's the big deal? You know, what, people slapping each other around a little bit. Right? You know, what, what, people running around trees for hours and on, on, on end, which many people say see as abusive. The running drill, or whatever right. it's called. He, he, he. I remember him saying, like, why the fuck do you have a problem with that? Like, well, that's right. good exercise and actually clears your head. Well, right, well, clearing your head and brainwashing or." fine line sometimes yeah interesting phrasing but he he uh, and also he didn't he really resisted being part of the you know the the community of anti scientology notwithstanding that when he got out and kind of blew the whistle on what he'd seen he was seen as the figurehead of the movement and the kind of the, the last best hope of toppling miscavige and was briefly you know it was said kind of uh, supposed to sort of launch be the martin luther of of kind of a reformed Scientology, he's put all of that behind him and began to see that, you know, that there was a trap, in his view anyway, in falling in with anti-Scientology, that that was just a kind of a monolithic, you know, enemy of kind of clear thinking in its own way. And then, you know, since making our documentary, he initially thought it was pretty good, and then he's denounced us now. Well, yeah, well, then, you know, you get into questions about, you know, where does he come from? Yeah. You know what? You know what? You know because that 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 really didn't come up. I didn't at, at any point go like, "What happened to this guy?" Mm -hmm. You know, which are psychological questions. But um, but I thought what was really successful is that you know how like that one drill where you you know there's just two people sitting across from each other, yeah, bull baiting they call it. Yeah, well, that's almost like Meisner. <laughs> it's almost like the Meisner method of ex. You know what I mean? Where you I improvise. don't know Meisner. What's that? It's an acting exercise where it's just one on one, and you kind of provoke the other person with questions. Yeah, uh, that there is. You know, you can see how the structure of these ritualized um, exercises in Scientology break down the ego yeah. uh, in order to get to the raw goods of the the either the lizard brain or the desire to be part of something. Uh, you, you know, like I, I thought, and it was interesting to see actors in that position because they're so willing. Yes, exactly. Willing is a good word for it. You know, they're pliant and kind of available. And when I saw them turn up for our first audition, I was really struck both by, oh, wow, you know, Marty's getting back into this headspace of being inside Scientology, but also these kind of um, actors are arriving like little lambs. Yeah. You know, right, as they do in Scientology, I would imagine, kind of gambling around and right. saying, like, pet me, stroke me, and and let me kind of have a little ribbon around my neck. With yeah, a bell well, on that, I mean, Scientology seeks those actors sometimes. Yeah, and and you feel like you know a, the process of creating a, a a fringe religious group or indeed a fringe movie is is not so very different. And 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 there's a sort of journey between seeing them molded, seeing as through the 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 bull baiting the the ability to both dish out and withstand abuse 
and 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 the acquisition of what's described as a dedicated glare, which is what Scientologists are supposed to aspire to have, the sense of self-possession and a, an ability to kind of not be uh, affected by other people's social and physical cues, but to kind of own their own social space, be intimidating, you know, where necessary. Um, that that then leads to these encounters where. The people arrive, the Scientologists arrive at the airport and begin hurling abuse at Marty, and you, you think, well, they're just bull baiting Marty. Yeah. And then you hear about the hole, and, how, and that feels like a kind of extension of, of what they do at the airport. There's definitely a kind of linear. Yeah. Thing, you know? I thought it was very successful, and, you know, I, I, we, we, I don't want you to miss your screening, um, but I enjoyed the movie. I enjoyed talking to you, and uh, I, I hope that my lack of. Uh, of, uh, Doing your homework. Didn't... Uh, no, I really enjoyed being here, Mark. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Lewis. That was good. I, that was an honest mistake at the end, the uh, Lewis Louie thing. I, I didn't mean it to be a joke. I'm glad it played as a joke. But I, uh, I like him a lot, and I, I believe he knows he's funny. I think he's funny. And thanks again to Fusion TV's The AV Club for sponsoring the episode today. Pop culture is everywhere. According to non-existent studies, it's 83% of the things you consume, even more than oxygen. At the acclaimed pop culture website, The AV Club, it's all they ever want to talk about. Now they're coming to TV. The AV Club, hosted by John Tatey, is a weekly deep dive that illuminates all the fun, strange corners of pop culture. The AV Club airs Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern on Fusion TV. Visit fusion.net slash where to watch for details. All right. Um, uh, yeah, uh, go to WTFPod.com for all your WTF Pod needs. That's a Squarespace website. I just threw that in. Yeah, I wasn't contracted to do that. I think I'll play a little guitar if I can figure out how to get everything up and running here. <laughs> 